My name is Deborah Cohen, and I am a professor at the University of Massachusetts School of Law at Dartmouth. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what you might expect when you get to law school. I think it's very exciting that you've decided to go to law school. I think it's the best decision you could ever make. But there's a lot you should know before you get there, because it can make the experience much better. Now, this is the beginning of your series of presentations on contracts law. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about contracts. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a framework, and then we're going to turn and talk about the three cases that you had in your packet. The, pre the format here is going to be a quasi-Socratic dialogue. I will tell you the questions I would ask and some of the qu answers I get. And I'll interpose a little bit of insight as to where and why you might do different things. Now let me start by telling you a little bit about contracts. Contracts is the law of when we're going to enforce private agreements. It's very different than other areas like criminal law, which many of you may be familiar with. But contracts is about private agreements and when our society should enforce these. When we should take private dollars and enforce yours and my agreement or your brother's agreement with your uncle or any other agreement. And it's really a lot of policy issues that underlie the legal issues. Now, I'm going to tell you straight off, you got to learn who your professor is and what your professor wants, because we are all different. What I tell you here today will have some general transference, but there will be particular nuances that you're going to have to adapt in order to deal with your particular professor. For example, some of us love policy. We're policy, policy, policy. We always want to know what the underlying policy is. Some of us don't care so much about policy in the first year. We mention it here and there. But we're really concerned with helping you get some fundamental how to read cases and identify law. So it's up to you to identify what does your professor want. And every professor is different. Now, you may start by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do I have to start doing all this people reading? That's not law school. And I have to tell you that while it doesn't come across in what we teach you, it's not one of the skills we list, you have to learn to read people, it actually is one of the skills you need in law school and as a lawyer. Because when you're dealing with clients and when you're dealing with judges and other lawyers, you've got to learn to read them and direct your arguments and rationales and focus everything to appeal to them, particularly your judges and juries. Okay, so. Different professors are going to do it differently. But I'm going to give you an overview to start. Contracts has five major areas. Now, some of your professors will give you a roadmap. They'll put it in the syllabus. They'll put it on the board. They'll give you an overview the first day. Or maybe that first chapter of your textbook will do it. Some won't. Some will just dive right in, and you're going to have to find your own roadmap. I'll give you a hint for contracts. There are five chunks if you were to break it up. The first, the way I teach it, is formation. Do we have an enforceable agreement? Now, not every professor starts with formation. Some actually start at my last one, which I'll get to in a minute. So after formation, if you have a contract that the law might enforce, the question is, well, what did we agree to? The second chunk of material is, what are the terms? What did we agree to? After you figure out what we agreed to, the third chunk is, well, did we do it or not? And if we didn't do it, was there a good reason so I'm not in trouble? All right, so if you have an enforceable agreement and you know what it says and the parties did or didn't do it, then you can go on. Now, if the parties didn't do it, they're in breach of contract and you're going to be entitled to a remedy. And really, that's what it's all about, whether you are entitled to something because the other person didn't do what he promised to do. So a lot of professors actually will start with remedies, what you get when they don't perform. The final chunk of materials, which not every contracts professor will cover, is called the third party rights. When some outsider has rights under the contract. So those are your five chunks of any contracts class. And sometimes you'll spend more or less time on any one. But those are the basic issues you'll cover. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the concepts you're going to get introduced to when you study formation. Do we have a contract? Now, let's begin by saying 
It's really important to listen in class. Now, if I tell you that listening is the most important yet least taught study skill, you can think back and say, whoever taught me to listen? Pay attention, listen, that, that's all anyone ever told you. And there's a tendency in law school, in class particularly, to want to scribble everything down. But that's not going to help you. You really need to stop and listen and assimilate and write down what's important. Because if you're so busy writing the whole time, you won't have a chance to think about it. And not everything that is said in class is of equal importance. You'll see from the sample notes that went with this lecture that there's often not a lot that you want to get. There are key issues or points in addition to your briefs. But we'll see that as we go along. We're going to start with the first of the three cases in your packet, and that would be the Lucy against Zemmer case. Now, this was the longest of the cases I gave you. I edited it down to about three pages, but there's a lot in here. So let's get started. This is in many contracts textbooks, one of the first cases you'll get very early on. And many, many professors in your first weeks of law school, and in almost any class, will start by asking you, so, so what are the facts? We want to know what the facts are. Now, that seems like a really easy question, because you've read the case and you know what the facts are. But do you have to give all the facts? You have two and a half pages of facts. And if you were to put all of that in your brief, or if you were to try and repeat all of that in class, well, you'd be going on a very long time, and it's very hard to figure out well, which ones are important. So you have to very early on figure out which are the relevant facts, OK? I always assert the Goldilocks principle, and I will assert this several times throughout my presentation. Not too much, not too little, just right. Again, this is professor specific. What's enough for me is not necessarily enough for the person teaching next door. So you are going to have to pay attention in the early days of a class and figure out how much detail does this professor want? Is he looking for bare bones minimum or does she want a lot of the flavor and color? I'll confess. Generally, I want the bare bones minimum, but there are some cases that have so much good stuff in them, I do go for flavor and color. And sometimes that's hard to predict, so we seem very difficult to figure out what do you want. It is something that is trial and error and practice, and you will get it over time. So which facts were important in this case? Now, I've taught this case many times, and I've had people wanting to start out with, well, Mr. Lucy wanted to buy the 471-acre farm um, from Mr. Zemmer, and um, he shared the purchase with his half-brother, and it was for $50,000, and they go on and on and on, and that's not really what was important. Other people want to just focus immediately on, well, they got together and they were drinking down a lot. They were, what, um, high as Georgia pines. And they just want to talk about whether, well, he was too drunk to have any ability to enter into a contract. Now, I'll tell you right now, cases can often be used for more than one purpose. But in your casebook, they're edited for a particular purpose. There are laws out there which deal with whether you're too drunk to enter into a contract. That's called incapacity, and you'll get to that later on. But that's not the point of this case. And so while it might be very interesting to you, it's not what this case was focusing on. And that's one of the first lessons. We tend to gravitate towards things that are interesting to us. And therefore, we're making all kinds of assumptions or preconceived notions about things. And you have to back up. And in briefing your cases, and in preparing for class, and in presenting in class, you have to put the whole thing together. It's not just the issues. It's not just the facts. It's which facts are necessary to address the issue in this case. So ask yourself, what facts do I need to present here for the court to answer the question? What facts do I need to draw out of all of these pages to say, the court can answer the question in this case with these facts. 